E-bikes on a mountain bike trip. They open up the trails to more riders, a big plus in my book. However, most affordable e-bikes have a hub motor and a cadence sensor. Not ideal for trail riding. For that, you need an e-mountain bike. And those need a mid-drive and a torque sensor. That equals big bucks, typically $3,000 plus. There is, though, a brand known for both pro-level bikes and budget bikes at Walmart, Hyper. And they're changing what an affordable e-mountain bike can be. With this bike, part of their e-ride mountain bike line of e-bikes sold at Walmart, this is the e-ride mid-drive mountain mid-drive for this. A torque-sensing, hyper-branded, Vinca-made mid-drive system mounted to a purpose-built full-suspension mountain bike. There's lots here, and at the current price, $14.98 at the time of making this video, it is, as far as I know, in undiscovered country. Is this too good to be true? In this video, we're going to find out. I'm going to break this into three segments. I'm going to start with a component overview. Then we'll see how it rides. Then I'll put the components and the ride together and make a determination. Is this the e-mountain bike I've been waiting for? Here we go, component overview. Let's run through these quick so I can get to the ride. We'll come back and see how these work out. Starting up top at the bars. Mountain bike handlebars, 720 millimeters wide, 31.8 diameter, wrapped with slip-on grips. A half grip on the right side to accommodate the twist shifter, a Shimano Revo shift. To the left of the bars, there's a full grip and a computer display, and we'll see this in action shortly, as well as all its features. For now, just know it's a monochrome display, somewhat large, but it has easy-to-access controls and a USB port with an integrated cover if you don't pull it out. Brakes, alloy levers, and cables give away that these are mechanical. They aren't generic, though. These are Tektro mechanical disc brakes. 160 millimeter rotors, front and rear model, Tektro Aries. Stem and headset. Stem is mountain bike stem. It's short, 45 millimeters. Headset, Neko branded with sealed bearings for the 1 and 1 8 inch straight steerer fork. Fork features. There's a preload adjuster and a manual lockout. There are no stated specs for suspension travel, but a measure 100 millimeters in grease marks. Model XCM32. 32. 32 for the 32 millimeter stanchions. And there's this. I don't know if you see the text here, but it says boost. That's here at this boost through axle. I'm going to venture a guess that many of you didn't expect that. There are more surprises coming like these hubs. They're Quanta branded, better than the usual big box hubs. Took these apart and they're actually lubricated. Let's look at the wheels starting with the rims. These are double wall alloy rims with a rim braking channel. More on that coming up. These are 29 inch wheels. And tires that are fit to them, 29 by 2.20 knobbies, but not very aggressive knobbies. Pedals are alloy, Neko branded, and they're fit to Lasco 175mm alloy crank arms, which in turn are bolted to the big ticket item on this bike, the mid-drive system. As I've already mentioned, this is torque sensing, and I even have a brand. Now, officially, it's Hyper Powertrain, but I found out it's made by Vinca, makers of the Vinca drive system. They have a website, vinca.jp. I looked it over, and I believe this is a variation of their E20 mid-drive. This particular one, 36 volt, 250 watts. Extra bonus, a frame-mounted chain guide. Let me stop here and say that if you don't know what a torque-based mid-drive is, or torque sensing, or cadence sensor, any of that, I have a video. I have a link down in the description. I recommend you watch that. The mid-drive, the clear big ticket item here, the rest of the drivetrain, more of what we're accustomed to seeing on a bike from Walmart. Seven speeds shifted with a Shimano Torni, a Torni TZ, red jockey wheel and all. Those seven speeds are via a freewheel. It is a mega range, but it's also a freewheel. The axle running through the lubricated Quanta hub, but... As you can see, this is a bolt-on, no quick release. There is, thankfully, a replaceable derailleur hanger, giving the frame some promise. This dual suspension frame is aluminum, the frame size 17 inch. I have all the geometry specs, including an official technical drawing of the bike. I'll get the full detail on that on a follow-up video. For now, I'll tell you the head tube angle that I know a lot of people want to know about. It's slack, 66 degrees. The rear suspension pivot system is going to look familiar to Hyper Hydroform fans. The color of this frame, they call matte gray, it's almost a pewter finish. 
with black accents. This frame looks good and it's a lot like the other E-Ride mountain bikes, at least up front, with the integrated battery which can be charged in or out of the box. Bike is rated for speeds up to 20 miles per hour, and there are even battery specifics on a sticker. More on these in a moment. First, let's look at the other big ticket item on the mid drive mountain. Above that mid drive, bolted to the pivot system, the rear shock. This is one of the other surprises on the bikes. The model of this shock, 562, the brand Exaform, which is a brand made by Kind Shock. The surprise here is that this is an air shock. Not at all what I expected when I unboxed this. Welcome, but not what I expected. And it's a decent little shock with a rebound control. Other components of note, the seat post is 304 millimeter in diameter. It has a usable seat mount. The saddle, one of the stitched Snafu branded saddles we've seen on other Hyper bikes. Not bad for OEM saddles, probably the best budget bike saddles I've seen. So far, there are a few budget trade-offs, but mostly it's nice stuff, at least for the dollar. An air shock, a torque sensing mid-drive, the boost fork. Does it all come together for a usable ride, though? And remember, we're talking about trail riding, because this is the E-Ride mid-drive mountain. I've had this out at the trail a few times, so let me start out talking about this as a bike, factoring out all the electrical power. Out of the box, it shifts through all seven gears. Fitment, I'm 5'10", and I feel pretty good here. I do have the seat as low as it will go, so this is probably a 5'9 and up ride. The reach, it's good, and this is smooth, with no noticeable creaking or complaints from the suspension system. That air shock, I played around with the air pressure until it hit the sweet spot. And I tried to give you a shot of it, but this is the best angle I could come up with. Just know the rear suspension works. So does the fork. It's a sun tour, so minimal acceptable for trail use. That said, it doesn't instantly bottom out on small bumps, and it keeps me in control. The only real holdup performance-wise is the tires, at least on these trails. I can't go as fast as this bike gives me the capability to go. I don't know what compound these are because I've ridden similar tread patterns here on these same trails, and they were okay. These slow me down a lot. They feel more like racing slicks than mountain bike knobbies, so be forewarned. Now let's merge the bike parts in with the electrical goodness parts. Now, I've ridden some high dollar torque based mid drives and I've ridden very budget mid drives. This mid drive, Hyper, Vinca, whoever, should be very happy with themselves. The torque sensing is absolutely stellar. Example, here I'm on flat ground at max pedal assist and hopefully you can hear that this motor isn't engaging because I'm in a low gear and I'm pedaling without putting much force on the pedals. Compare that to this, same terrain, same gearing, same assist level. I'm putting more pressure on the pedals. You can actually hear as I speed up and I slow down, I'm putting more leg energy into the pedals the motor scaling up and down with me. There's absolutely no discernible latency, no power rises or power cuts at unexpected times. It's almost like it's wired to my brain and perfectly works with the impulses to my legs. Six million dollars not needed, you could call me the fifteen hundred dollar man because I'm now bionic. This all means that on the trail, no surprise, power bursts and smooth acceleration. I call it power with intent, trademark. It will give me power right up to the 20 mile per hour rated top speed. I clocked it at 20.3 as assisted top speed, but I tend to keep it at 15 miles per hour or under due to the slickery tires. I don't want an e-mountain bike for top speed. I want help with endurance, especially up hills, and this bike makes child's play out of hills. Like this one with lots of hidden roots and it's steeper than it looks, yet I can pedal up this like I'm in second gear on basically flat ground. The beauty is that I'm not exhausted when I get to the top from the climb. I can ride further, just keep on going. More trail riding, always good, right? Here's another example of the difference this makes in my ride abilities. I usually ride a similar loop. I have a few loops and I pick one and that's what I'll ride that day. Put me on an e-mountain bike and I not only ride those loops, all of them, but I have energy left to ride everything else, even the stuff that gets untouched, where it's even hard to find where the trail goes. And to put the mid-drive's bottom bash guard to use, only to start looking around and realize that I actually am lost. And I'm not gonna lie, in the middle of the summer, this would annoy me because I'm usually spent at this point. But now I get to adventure further because I have the e-mountain bike assist to me. I'm not burned out. That is a big deal. A lot of entry level mountain bikers, I've ridden with them. The first time they ride on the trail and it doesn't take far, like 100 yards, 150 yards, and they're really hurting because they're not used to riding with that much exertion. And don't say that it's cheating. 
because it's really not because I can dial down the pedal assist level and do most or all of the work if I want to. The important thing is the empowerment. This gives more people more range on the trails. That's always a good thing. How much range do you get out of this bike? Well, the stated range is 20 plus miles. And I can tell you at max pedal assist, I've ridden this 10 plus miles, still had half the battery charge left. I'll do a specific video where I cover ranges in each of the pedal assist modes, but 10 plus miles per charge, that's a lot of trail riding for the average rider. It's enough for me to loop around and keep getting lost and somehow winding back up at the exact same spot. Which, as I've already mentioned, would not only exhaust me, but really frustrate me, but I'm not worried here because I have the extra range. I fully expect 15 plus miles out of each charge which is a lot of trail riding for the average rider and also being able to do so without having to take breaks. That equals lots and lots of fun. So yeah, I guess if it isn't obvious so far, I'll just say it, I do like this bike. The only issues that I've had trail riding are the slickery tires and then one other issue that happened somewhere right about here. I had a chain drop, which was an oddball anomaly because this bike not only has a chain guide, the chain drop happened up front. So I'm really curious how this happened. I don't know, maybe a stick wedged in there and it just didn't feel it, which could happen with the torque based system because it's magnifying what I'm doing. So I don't feel that hard extra bit of energy that you need to break a stick. I don't know. Whatever happened, this only happened one time. It hasn't happened since, but it did happen. So I'm going to share it with you. So just to count it up, that's one chain drop and the tires are slippery. Everything else about the ride, I absolutely love. This is a nice bike. Now it's not something you're gonna bomb down hills on the Sun Tour Fork. It's a Sun Tour Fork. It does help on routes and such. You just have to be careful. If there's one main takeaway, it's the perfect tuning of this mid-drive system. 100% on par with the expensive systems. How they did that, I don't know, but Hyper has pulled it off. Here's another example of the difference this bike can make in a ride. I'm on the dreaded, at least for me, uphill climb on Wildwood's Ranger sides. I absolutely detest this part of the trail. Reaching the top, always a point to pause and gather my wind. But on the mid-drive mountain with my bionic legs, I can pull right up the worst parts of this. When I reach the top, I'm good to go to ride the rest of the trail, which is the fun part. I have actually seen people get to about this point and then just stop and give up and say they just can't do this. Well, if they had a mid-drive mountain, they would still be riding. That's going to build some courage in their mind. That's going to get them on a mountain bike more often. So you can see the benefits, the pro arguments for bikes like the Hyper E-Ride Mid-Drive Mountain. They're starting to stack up. It even does great things, like a trail closed. No problem for the E-Ride Mid-Drive Mountain, actually. I had permission to be on this part. They're revamping even more trails out at Wildwood. They're even gonna be sponsoring one. So this closed trail, this used to be the twisties that I used to ride quite regularly on the mountain bike trail. As awesome as this bike is, it, it can't rebuild the trail. So let's jump to my overall opinion now that I've had the ride on it. So I've got the ride. Let's look at the equipment, how it's equipped now versus how well all that rode and get a final determination. First, what I like, the fitment. It's good, the 720 millimeter bars inspire trail confidence because they're right in my sweet spot. The Neko headsets, I've ridden these on many hyper bikes, I really like them. The disc brakes, yes, they're not hydraulic disc brakes, which would have been awesome, but they are Tektro Aries and they do stop the bike quite well. Don't underestimate good mechanical disc brakes and good brakes important on a bike that weighs 55.2 pounds. This Suntour fork, it meets my minimal acceptable level for some green trail fun, the boost up front, an added bonus for some. I'm gonna add these hubs to my like list. They're smooth rolling and yeah, they're nothing super fancy with the Quanta brand, but they are a step above what we normally see on big box bikes and what they could have easily thrown here kind of gotten away with it. Here's a minimally blurry picture of the model number. If you're into hub models, you can zoom in and get that. My heart belongs to 27.5 wheels, but 29er, it's what the most people prefer, so I respect that. I'm gonna add it to my likes since this is a 29er. This matte gray aluminum frame, it appears to be well made. It doesn't flex at the pivots like a bad frame, and I've had one of those recently. The mid-drive, it's integrated into it. 
a definite like. This computer display, computer control module, whatever you want to call it, it's easy to read, easy to see even in broad daylight, and easy to use with the plus and minus buttons to control the pedal assist modes all the way down to zero where you can do all the work or all the way up to the pedal assist 5 that turns you into a powerhouse. It will tell you how fast you're rotating the pedals, give you a trip meter, an odometer, and the average and max speed achieved on a ride. It also has a backlight for nighttime use, and don't forget that USB port which may open up some future opportunities that I'm still investigating. This may seem trivial, but I like that the stickers give the max rider weight. A lot of people always ask that. It's printed on the box as well. 275 pounds for this bike. It's also interesting to see an e-bike with a Snell helmet recommendation. That makes sense, 20 miles per hour being able to do that anywhere you want to do it on a trail. Also, the sticker with the battery rating. Let's talk about this battery. It's the integrated battery, it pops out very easy, easy in, easy out. And you may have noticed that in my bike riding shots, I switched back and forth between two batteries. I did that on purpose to show that the form factor is identical between this bike and the other Hyper E-Ride batteries. A plus because those bikes often go on sale super cheap. Note that they are the same form factor, but the mid-drive battery is a slightly higher capacity at 367 watt hours versus the 281 watt hours of the other E-Ride bike batteries. Capacity aside, they are completely interchangeable as you saw, and Hyper told me the batteries are UL2271 certified. So I regularly switch and swap. I usually try to carry two batteries, though I've never needed more than one on any of my trail rides. Still on my likes, of course, the two big ticket items make it onto the list. The mid-drive, 36 volt, 250 watt, that's plenty of usable power for a torque-based mid-drive easily propelling me up even large hills. Hyper, very proud of this, very proud of the entire bike. They told me so, and per Hyper, this is UL2849 certified via third-party lab SGS, if that lab name means anything to you. My second big ticket like the inclusion of an air shock for that rear suspension. You're paying for the mid-drop, so this could have been a coil afterthought. It's really nice to see a factory rear shock that's completely usable out of the box. Still in the likes, and I'm talking about the pivot system. I know lots of you want to know about this pivot system. I gotta admit, I look this over and I see certain things that make me curious. Move to the back and I see nylon and instantly fear the worst. Fortunately, when I dug into the works, the picture's not so bleak. Now this isn't as good as bearings, but at least it's not solid plastic everywhere. The front pivots have metal bushings with what looks like a coating of some kind. The same on both sides. At the rear, that visible nylon, well, that's not seated bushings, that's spacers, which is fine. The actual bushings, they themselves, are in fact metal. What I see here isn't anything I have any immediate concerns with. Time will tell. For now, it's on my okay list. As yet, I haven't dug into this part of the pivot system, but I do instantly see one difference. There is some branding on the rubber caps. That's my likes and everything I'm okay with. There are a few dislikes, seven speeds I can deal with. The choice to go with, and this is where they clearly had to budget to get to some of the other components at this price. I don't like that this bike is equipped with a freewheel, which historically has weaker axles, at least on big box bikes. And it's compounded with the fact that there's boost up front, but then the rear wheel is for some reason bolt on and not quick release. It, it's an odd choice. Now we'll say that the axle concerns may be minimized a bit by the use of the better hubs, but still it's not enough to keep bolt on slash freewheel from my dislike list. The tourney, that's overshadowed by my dislike of what's on the other end of that, the twist shifter. I am not a fan of budget twist shifters on a full suspension mountain bike, especially one that's $1,500. Does it work? Yes, so don't give me the lecture about how SRAM has twist shifters. They're not a Revo shift. Ride even moderately hard on a trail with this and you will have accidental shifts. I can easily fix that so it's not a deal killer for me, which could have really put this on the blurred lines list, like the rim brake channel on the wheels. Historically, I've seen this on budget bikes where they use whatever wheel they can to get whatever's cheapest on there. Here though, and I've started to see this on many e-bikes, I think this choice is on purpose because rim brake channel wheels have a thicker sidewall, and when you're pushing around 55.2 pounds, maybe that's why this is here. And 
on some other e-bikes. Therefore, blurred lines, I don't count it against the bike. Also, blurred lines, these tires, because they are usable, but cautiously on the trail. Another entry into blurred lines, the straight head tube. Not because of the whole tapered versus straight argument, even though I do prefer taper. It's because the fork choices get slimmer when it's an oddball combo of a straight steerer combined with a boost wheel. This computer display, computer control, it's on likes because it works. It's on blurred lines because it has features that don't do anything. Like the headlight control, no headlight, thank goodness, exists on this bike. The final entry into blurred lines, so not good, not bad, just something to note is the lack of dropper support, which would be nice on a full suspension mountain bike. There is no cable provision, and there is a block that limits the depth of a seat post due to the suspension pivot. Though there may be room to make your own routing if you are adventurous. I'm gonna edit this in at the last minute. It's a plus for Hyper. Sometimes it's those little things I can't count. The number of bikes I've ridden that had rattly batteries because a company didn't want to spend a nickel for a little neoprene sticker to act as a cushion. Hyper did. So thank you, Hyper. I have much more nitty gritty detail to say about this bike, but I don't want this video to be an hour long. So I'm going to show you the technical drawings and let you glean what you can from that. But proceed with caution because there is some variance here. I'll cover that. I'm going to make a Geo and Specs video where I go over everything else as well as answer any of the questions that I didn't answer in this video that you had submitted about this bike. So make sure that you are subscribed and won't even re-verify that you're subscribed because I've been hearing people get unsubscribed mysteriously. Also make sure you have that notification bell active so you don't miss that video. And also want to say that I do consider this an e-mountain bike. Probably the first one, that, well definitely, the first one that I've seen at Walmart that I would classify as an e-mountain bike. $1,498 at the point of this video. More importantly, I see some future promise. I'm going to do things to this bike. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching Kev Central and have a great day.